Today's episode is brought to you by Brilliant.org. And welcome back to another video. And today we're going to talk about something that's not commonly talked about in the book community, or it's not really talked about anywhere else. So I hope in this video I get to use some of the little tidbits from my recent research into this kind of question that I think every book lover is currently struggling with or have struggled with at some point in their lives. And this problem right here is none other than the problem of a reading slump. So just to set a scene, sometimes you're reading a book, everything's going great. You're enjoying the book. You can't wait to finish the book. You can't wait to wake up the next morning or the next evening to read the book again. But sometimes you run into this tricky experience called reading slump where what you're reading isn't exactly aligned with your personal taste or isn't exactly aligned with what you want to be doing at this moment and something just isn't working right. And when this happens, you secretly think to yourself, should I keep reading this book or should I just run off and do something else? Or should I pick up another book? Sometimes we're simply unwilling to let the book go and we find ourselves stuck in this kind of limbo mode where we can't pick up another book. And at the same time, we can't really work up the courage to finish this book in our hands. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that's a reading slump for you. And generally speaking, reading slumps happen when there's a mismatch between your expectations of the book and the book at hand. Or in other words, it stems from a tension between what we think we want to read versus what we actually want to read. Because sometimes what you want to read could be quite different from what you think you want to read. Because as we know, as imaginative creatures, we all would like to think that we're better people than we actually are. So in our heads, we want to be the kind of person who enjoys the poetry of Baudelaire, or we want to think of ourselves as people who can just enjoy a play by Shakespeare in a side, you know, something high culture. But as the writer Robert Escarpet observed, the cultured man who knows Racine will never be so foolhardy as to admit that what he really loves is Tantin. Hence, sometimes we find it really hard to put down a book that we think we'll enjoy because we can't swallow our pride because we can't really allow ourselves to think that we've somehow misjudged our own taste. But the same observation also raises new questions. So why is it the case that sometimes our hearts are drawn toward different works of literature or different material for consumption or different music or different films, while other times we just kind of feel like, you know, what's on a best-selling list? They don't really tickle our fancy. What are these mysterious mechanics that are going on behind the scene? And why are we drawn to certain books and not others? And how do we use this mechanism to our advantage and to find things that we're actually going to enjoy? And for that, let us dive into this discussion about how attunement works. Why are we drawn to certain things and not others? And just as a bit of a side note, I will be drawing a lot from one of the books that I've read recently called Hooked, Art and Attachment by Rita Felsky. Even though the content of this book is quite amazing and quite interesting to read and there are some really, really illuminating insights in here, but uh, I actually would not recommend you to read this. Let me read it for you because this is quite dry and academic and at certain points, you won't even know what the hell you're reading. So unless you are also uh, in the field of uh, doing research or doing academic work. I wouldn't really put you through this reading experience. Just um, listen to this video if you're interested. I'm going to list this book in the description down below as a bit of a citation moment. But other than that, sit back and relax. So attunement and attachment, this is something that's quite universal. That's not just limited to literature or not just limited to high art. It's also something that you can experience when you are attached to a piece of music attached to a piece of film or attached to a really funny TV show. So at first, let's pick a medium that's a lot more immediate than literature to kind of understand how this mechanism works. Take music, for example. Sometimes you get lucky, you listen to a piece of music and you think to yourself, this is amazing. Why haven't I heard of this piece of music before? And let me stock this artist on Spotify straight away because I want to listen to everything that they have to offer. By other times, it takes a little longer for us to get attuned to a piece of music. Maybe the timing is not quite right. Maybe you've dated someone who liked this piece of music and now uh, you make your mission to dislike that piece of music. But sometimes even when you're not immediately attuned to a piece of music, after a while, or if you listen to the music 20,000 times, and someday if you really decide to get into someone's music and you make your mission to like that piece of music, attunement can happen again. You can get attached to the piece of music through a kind of conscious process. And this is what happened to the writer Zadie Smith. In her New Yorker article, Some Notes on Attunement, Zadie Smith described her complicated relationship with Joni Mitchell's music. Because as a woman of color, she's not exactly the kind of person who grew up with the demographic of the kind of people who would enjoy Joni Mitchell's music. And eventually when Zadie Smith went off to college, she was bombarded by people. Basically saying to her, 
What's wrong with you? Why don't you like Joni Mitchell's music? Because, you know, she's one of these amazing musicians back in the day. And this is probably true in your experience too. Maybe there's that musician that everyone's talking about or everyone's raving about, but you're sitting there thinking that like, I think I'm an idiot for not liking this musician. Why am I not connected to their work? And in those situations, you can either resist the work or try to really fit in and get into it. But in Zadie Smith's case, she decided to resist Joni Mitchell's music and perceived her albums as tuneless, discordant, a white girl's warbling that was a little more than noise. Pretty harsh judgments, I know, but that's not really the end of the story. After a decade-long effort of resisting Joni Mitchell's music, Smith was in her 30s, and she found herself in a car uh, driving with her husband to a wedding in Wales. And coincidentally, Joni Mitchell's music was playing on the radio, but that was the last thing on Zadie Smith's mind. At the time, she was in a foul mood, and as the article had it, she was craving a sausage roll from a gas station, so she wasn't really in the right headspace to really think about the music. But then she looked out at the window, watching the scenes passing by her, listening to the music, and she found herself humming Joni Mitchell's music. And in a moment of attunement, as I remember it, some flooded the area. My husband quoted a line from one of the Lucy poems. I began humming a strange piece of music, humming Joni, yet not conscious of the transformation. So what happened there was a sudden moment of attunement. She learned to appreciate a piece of music or a musician that she didn't previously like. And these moments tend to go beyond the music itself. Sometimes you find yourself living in a fresh new reality after you've learned to appreciate a new piece of music, new piece of art, and in the case of reading a new piece of literature. When you get lucky sometimes, you can read the first line of a novel and get immediately sucked in. You're bewitched. You can't wait to turn the pages. You can't wait to finish the book and you can't wait to tell everyone about the book. And those moments, they tend to make up some of our fondest memories when it comes down to reading, like those rainy days under the cover, like those uh, long nights when you're reading with a lamp underneath your bed sheet. But as we get older, we find it more and more difficult to click into these moments. Sometimes we wonder to ourselves, have we lost the capacity to be attached to a certain piece of work? Have we lost that capacity to get really excited about a piece of novel? Well, the answer to that is, not really, but it is the case that books are just a little bit trickier to deal with than music. In the case of music, what you hear is kind of what you're gonna get. So attunement is a very straightforward process. You either like the music or you don't like it, you either listen to it five times or you leave it in the trash. But with a book, the act of interpreting the text or the act of reading the text, that kind of serves as a barrier between you and being attached to this piece of work. And also, there's an additional layer. In his book, Infocracy, the Korean-German philosopher Byung Chul Han observed that from the Enlightenment to the end of the 20th century, the book was the central medium. At the time, writers and journalists, they occupied the center stage of culture. Whenever you want to know something about the world, a magazine or a book, they are the devices that you'll turn to to know something about the world. And whenever you want some kind of entertainment, all you have are really cartoons, and storybooks and novels. So this public that Byung Chul Han described was a reading public. It is not the kind of public that gets to know the world through all these wonderful devices that we have around us. Words served as the main mediator between events and the public. In our world, however, we don't really have a reading public. What we have is kind of like a media public where we're immediately exposed to images and sounds before we even have to read a single thing. So nowadays, we no longer have to be well-trained readers or readers at all to get to know the world, which is a really fascinating phenomenon. And if we apply this phenomenon to being attuned to certain books we want to read, can you see the problem here? Because we're constantly surrounded by images and sounds, sometimes we can know a book's content, or we can judge a book by its cover, or we can judge a book by an online review without ever reading the first chapter of the book. So what this creates is kind of a gap between attuned to the digital representation of the book versus being attuned to the actual reading experience of the book itself. Just because you really like the sound of a book from a review or from a clipping on Instagram or from a TikTok doesn't actually guarantee that you're actually going to like the book when you sit down to read it. And when you spend a lot of time building up this mental image of the book in your head without actually reading the book, when you actually get down to reading the book, you might actually discover that you don't really like the book that much. So that's what kind of creates the gap between what you think you want to read versus what you actually want to read. And when you find yourself in one of these moments, you'll find yourself in a bit of a reading slump. 
And the solution to that problem here is to somehow resist all the incoming information from the media public and to kind of force yourself into this ritual of reading a book before knowing anything about it first. And this is what happened to the author of this book, Rita Felsky, when she found herself in a bookstore on vacation. So she's not really thinking about picking a specific book to read. She picked out Ishiguro's novel, The Unconsoled, in an English language bookshop without really knowing what the book is about. Immediately after reading the first line, she found herself completely gripped by the book. She was drawn abruptly and without recourse into a maze-like narrative set in an unnamed Central European city. And it was a book that she cannot not read until the book is done. But after she finished a book, put it away, and fired up her laptop to look at the reviews, critics didn't really agree with her. James Wood commented, Ishiguro's new novel has the virtue of being unlike anything else. It invents its own category of badness. Meanwhile, Michiko Katutani from the New York Times considered the book a dogged, shaggy dog narrative that sorely tries the reader's patience. And of course, it's a sad situation to like something, only to find out that people around you don't really agree with you. But at the same time, had Felsky read that book after reading on her reviews, she probably wouldn't have the same uh, attunement with the book. And Ishiguro's story probably would have not taken her on this extended journey through this really fascinating narrative had Felsky agreed with the critics before ever cracking open the first chapter. Coming back to our experience, if we first of all look up the book on the internet, if we just read everything about the book before ever reading the first chapter of the book ourselves, it is possible for us to judge a book by its cover or judge the book by its reviews as to miss out on some potentially really interesting reading experiences. And as a result, we miss out on some great opportunities for us to get lost in a book that we love because we're so concerned with the best-selling list. We're very concerned about, you know, is this the book that I should be reading or is this what everyone else is reading? And in order for us to combat that, judging a book by its cover syndrome, it's helpful for us to just read the book first without knowing anything about it. You know, download a chapter from iBooks for free or read a few pages at the bookstore because nowadays we live in a media public and it's actually easier for us to know something before actually experiencing it. And long story short, that's the solution to reading slumps. We need to bridge the gap between the idea of the book or what we think we'd like to read versus what we're actually reading to the point where the two kind of merge into one. That doesn't mean that we'll never ever look up a bestseller list ever again. And it doesn't really mean that we shouldn't struggle with harder reading material just to get to that point of attunement and attachment. It simply means being open. It simply means not letting your ideas about a thing, getting the way of the actual thing itself. It simply means removing all the conceptions or the misconceptions that you have about a book and just dive head in and just enjoy yourself. If you're not into James Baldwin right now, it's okay. If you're not into some poet's works, it's okay, give it time. Let your circumstances influence the way you think and maybe one day after a few years of living life, then you decide to pick up some poem that you've never read or decide to pick up James Baldwin again or decide to tackle Ulysses one more time. And this time, you might just find yourself enjoying a book that you think you would enjoy. And that's all I have to say on this problem of the reading slump or the art of attunement or the art of attachment. And I hope you guys have enjoyed today's video. And before we go here, just a quick word for today's video sponsor, Brilliant.org. In short, Brilliant is where you learn critical thinking by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in mathematics, data analysis, programming, and artificial intelligence. Their classes and modules are developed by professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, etc., with an emphasis on first principles, not through memorization, but through practicing these problems in a fun and interactive way. And beyond just mathematics, science, and AI, and programming, Brilliant.org is really here to foster a sense of critical thinking in you through instilling a daily learning habit. So personally, as someone who's working in a field of literary criticism, I really want to know what the future of literature really is, what the future of writing really is. So right now I'm poking my head into this new course by Brilliant.org called How Large Language Models Work. So if you want to understand how AI creates texts and builds a vocabulary, this is the new course for you. And as a lucky viewer of this channel, access Brilliant.org through the link in the description for a 30-day free trial for Brilliant.org alongside a 20% off of your annual subscription if you do use the service around a year. Thank you Brilliant for for sponsoring today's video while making these videos more accessible for you guys while allowing me to craft more of these video essays for you guys and thank you for watching today's video for now take care and goodbye